Just remain standing as we read from God's Word together from Acts chapter 6, verses 1 through 7. We continue on in our time of study in Acts 6. Luke writes, Now in the days when the disciples were increasing in number, a complaint by the Hellenists arose against the Hebrews because their widows were being neglected in the daily distribution. And the twelve summoned the full number of the disciples and said, It is not right that we should give up preaching the word of God to serve tables. Therefore, brothers, pick out from among you seven men of good repute, full of the spirit and wisdom, whom we will appoint to this duty. And we will devote ourselves to prayer and the preaching and to prayer and the ministry of the word of God. And what they said pleased the whole gathering, and they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit, and Philip, and Prochorus, and Nicanor, and Timon, and Parmenas, and Nicholas, a proselyte of Antioch. They sat before the disciples, or the apostles, and they prayed and laid their hands on them. And the word of God continued to increase, and the number of the disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem. And a great many of the priests became obedient to the faith. Amen. Amen. God bless the reading of his word. So if you could be seated, (laughs) sorry. Um, Continue on in our time in Acts. As we look through uh, this book, I think you see something of a pattern that is beginning to uh, emerge. uh, And that is uh, this pattern that uh, there is backlash against the church uh, as, the, as the church continues to grow in numbers, there just this increasing backlash begins to happen. First part of this backlash was really from the outside of the church in terms of persecution. So as the church is growing now, the religious rulers don't like giving up their authority. So they are pushing back now and trying to stop the preaching and teaching of the Bible. God overcomes that. There's a second backlash that, ca- that happens on part of Ananias and Sapphira. Uh, Ananias and Sapphira were a part of the church and uh, were publicly deceitful. And in fact, they were, what they were doing was really testing the Lord. You know, is the Lord really true to his word? Are his people really going to be true uh, to his word? And can we get away with lying to God in front of the entirety of the congregation? The answer was no. Holiness is part of the mandate of the church, at least personally. And uh, so that, that in the midst of that backlash, God had a remedy for that as well. Well, you come to the third one. The third one really is something I think is probably more akin to the ins and outs of our fellowship in local churches since that time. And that is the, 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 the problems that arise in the church and uh, the, the, the opportunities for division that come on the heels of those problems. And that's really what you see in chapter 6, verses 1 through 7. It reminded me, really, of uh, one of the first times I ever encountered this when I was young at the church that I grew up in. I I don't remember, um, really, any of the sermons that I ever heard preached there. It's a good church. It still is. Uh, But I do remember my first uh, congregational meeting. Um, It was quite contentious. And uh, there was a, a question about the calling of uh, a senior pastor. It's the first time I ever saw people that I had seen normally in the hallways laughing, you know, yucking it up after the service in open disagreement with each other and quite strident. And uh, that, was a, that was a moment for me as uh, a younger kid, you know, that this kind of thing happens in the church. And as it turned out, the person that was um, being you know, debated on, uh, never made it to come as the pastor of the church. Probably a good thing based on that discussion. Um, But it just, I think it just highlighted something for me that that every church, and this one included, this is no surprise when I say this, is full of sinners. That there are preferences, there are disagreements, and there are issues that arise. The question is, how do they get addressed? In what form do they get addressed? And are we relying on the moving of the Holy Spirit to help us address them? And certainly, and we're never going to have a show of hands on this, but if we were to ask, you know, how many have come out of situations like that, I'm sure a fair number would raise their hands. And it's just a, it's a part of what happens in the life of a church and sometimes happens unnecessarily, but again, everything is under God's hand. Well, you have one of those kinds of situations happening here. And so the, chapter 6, verses 1 to 7, I think, is more than just about the organization of the church with people trying to step up now to be uh, part of the serving aspect of the ministry, but it's really about church unity. 
And essentially, it's about everyone's job really being part of uh, protecting church unity. Church unity is everyone's job. It's not just the job of the leadership. It's not just the job of the people who may have a, it's actually all of our jobs to preserve the unity of the church. And I think as we get into this passage, we're going to see uh, th- that really start to come to the forefront here. And as you look at the passage then, if that's really the point that really all of our job is to protect this unity, you, you just kind of see here what's going on. Well, th- there's a growth that's taking place, a rapid growth that's leading to problems, okay? And one of the problems is highlighted here. There's a solution, a spirit-guided solution to that problem, and then right on the heels of that spirit-guided solution, then there is more growth that takes place in the church. So you just see growth, problem, solution, more growth. So we're just going to look at this in a couple different pieces, uh, starting in verses 1 and 2. These growth-related problems, they're small, but if they're not taken care of, they will come like a tidal wave and wipe everybody out. Listen again to what the text says. Now, in these days, when the disciples were increasing in number, a complaint by the Hellenists arose against the Hebrews because their widows were being neglected in the daily distribution. And the twelve summoned the full number of the disciples and said, it's not right that we should give up uh, preaching the word of God to serve tables. Okay, we'll just stop right there. So here is, in the beginning, a growth-related small problem that if not taken care of, if not addressed, will become like a tidal wave and wipe out a lot more people. Now, the, the church is growing like crazy. This, this sense of um, rapidness is like kind of every seminarian's dream, really. I mean, when, when I was in seminary, n- nobody would admit it, but everybody dreamed about, would I have the kind of church that would grow like crazy? You know, you're on the cover of a preaching magazine. There's not even a preaching magazine. But if there was, you know, my mug would be right on there, and everybody would think well of me, and I'd get interviewed, and this and, this and that. And, you know... We, we all think, we all, we all think of the, the, the wonderful blessing of rapid growth, and there is. You know, people, people are converted. You know, there are people coming around. People are growing in faith. And, and, and in this sense, it's just it's going like crazy. But there's, like, there's a blessing and a curse in this. I mean, the, the blessing is, yes, you see all of this uh, wonderful thing happening so rapidly. It's just going straight into the stratosphere numerically. But the, the challenge of it is, is that you have more people coming around. Okay, so that, which is bringing more... Um, in, in a sense, issues and, and some headaches and some real challenges. And I think, you know, one of the biggest challenges for any church that has any kind of rapid growth is, I think, you know, since two part. Well, and the, on, the, on the one sense, on the one hand, there's a pride that sort of creeps into a rapidly growing church, a very easy pride that you can fall into in thinking, especially on the part of the leadership, that they are somehow responsible. They're the cause of that growth by what they're doing. People start to look at themselves thinking, you know, uh, it's, it's all about me. It's about what we're doing here. And um, they lose sight of the fact that it's really God who's given the increase. And it's, <clears throat> it's clear here from this passage that what's really increasing is the word of God. The word of God increased. As the word of God spread, more people came into contact with the word of God through the spirit of God and the church started to grow. Pride, pride tells us a lie that we, we human beings are, are, are the cause of this. Neglect also creeps in. Neglect of people. Sometimes when you have a, a tremendous amount of people and very few people in leadership, um, you, you just by nature would have some neglect. What also can happen is that you have neglect of doctrine. You have neglect of di- discipleship. You have neglect of some of the basic spiritual needs that people have, you get neglect of sound theology. And these things can potentially creep in, and we read stories about them in churches. And for me, my, I, I pause on some of this stuff now. I think rapidly growing churches are wonderful things, but it gives me pause because of the burden that comes with a large number of people coming into a place in a short period of time. You had one of those problems, I think, happening structurally here. <clears throat> and I'm calling it a structural problem because at some point, there was a distribution of food to needy people. We don't read about it. We don't know when it happened. It was just happening. And at some point, in the midst of that distribution, there was a group of people that were being left out of that distribution. Older, single women who were of Hellenistic background. I just met a lady this morning. Her name was Helen. I said, man, I, I wanted to call these people the Helen, you know, like... Because they were Hellenistic, but I didn't. But your name's Helen, you know. I hope she didn't come back. She'd probably feel very embarrassed. But, um, 
But I, I was thinking about the, okay, so the, the Helens here, the Helens are being left out. They're wondering where, 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 where is their food? If people who depend on the church to be able to eat aren't getting food, you have a massive problem. Organizationally, it needs to be handled. And so, you know, of all the headaches that would come with a rapid number of people coming into the fellowship, it's interesting here that Luke highlights this one and, and the remedy that comes with it in leadership. But, but, but just pause a second here, because there are plenty, I'm sure, plenty of things that were happening that would have required attention. I'm sure maybe some other inequities, if you like. <clears throat> but here, this was an inequity that threatened unity. Just look at the way this is structured. A complaint by the Hellenists arose against the Hebrews because their widows were being neglected in the daily distribution. So you have a couple things happening under the surface. The Hellenistic uh, Jews in that church spoke primarily Greek. Okay, so you have a little bit of an ethnic group over here. The Hebrews, the Jews in Palestine, spoke Aramaic. Okay, so you have a little bit of an ethnic difference on the other side. If you take those two sides and put them together, it's a wonderful thing. And, and I think um, in the first service, at least in, in, uh, in the prayer that I, that I prayed, I, I, I prayed uh, Ephesians, Ephesians 2, that we all have access in one spirit to the Father now. Now, when you see two different people groups come together, okay, and they're joined by the moving of the Holy Spirit, and, and that, the Holy Spirit is what is in common, powerful, bringing, you know, two different groups together. It's wonderful. What naturally occurs, though, with differing kinds of groups is, is people go into different corners. And we don't know what was happening in this church except that this, this problem is, is explained in terms of some of these backgrounds. Now, if you don't take this on, this, this small problem can become a much bigger problem where people start to look at each other and say, well, you know, I don't think I'm going to invite my, my Greek-speaking friends to church here because, frankly, they're getting left out. I don't think this church really cares about it, but all the Aramaic-speaking people, well, they're fine. They, they, get a, they, they get exactly what they need. You, you can kind of see how this kind of thing would become a tidal wave if, if you don't take care of it, this kind of tension. The other thing I think you see as well is something else that would maybe be a, a red flag to an outsider. Well, an outsider might say, you know, I'm, I'm looking at your uh, widows here, and I'm seeing that, you know, you have a wonderful message, but you can't really even take care of the needy people inside your church. And if you can't take care of the needy people inside your church, what makes me think that you're going to be able to take care of any other needs? You're neglecting your own. Now people come and say, well, you know, there's a lot of people, and, you know, there's food, and there's leadership, and, you know, we're just getting this, whatever. But the witness here is, is, are we able to take care of the least among us? And I think the last thing that becomes a, a point of tension that it's so important that these, these issues are addressed is that the 12 apostles are running around trying to do everything. Okay, they're trying to preach and teach. They're, 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 the God is moving in a pretty distinctive way. They're also trying to serve all the tables. <laughs> You know, here's the thing for the 12, you can't do it all. You, you cannot do it all. You need help from qualified people. And push is going to come to shove. There's going to come a breaking point. And that breaking point was some of these older widows are not eating. And that's a problem. So these little things can become big things if they're not addressed. And so they get addressed in, in very wise ways. First wise way I think you see here is in verse 2. And the twelve summoned the full number of the disciples and said, okay, we can't blow past that, for, you know, and just keep moving. But you have to look at the wise way this happened. So the twelve who were in the primary position of leadership summoned everyone. In other words, there was a collaboration on the part of the leadership with the laity, okay? The people that God had, you know, staked out to begin this thing called the church. And the people who were now coming to Christ were coming together to solve this problem. Very, very important. Because it takes the entire group, the whole team, if you like, to get through this. It's not going to just be a one-person or 12-person show. Not to take care of the needs of these people. There was collaboration in the midst of this. Now, 
if you think of the full number of disciples, we're talking thousands of people. I mean, here's 300 and some, three, 400 chairs or whatever. Imagine like tripling this and then tripling that. I, we don't know how many people were in this meeting, but that would have been a pretty wild congregational meeting. I mean, think about it. But somehow God was working in the midst of this to bring about a collaborative uh, answer or solution to a problem that was growing. I'm sure when people got together back then, if people are people, it wasn't just the distribution of food that people brought up. You know, I got an issue. Hey, oh, hang on. We're talking about the food here. Helen is not eating. That's, that's part of the issue. In fact, it's in her entire neighborhood that isn't eating. We got to deal with that first. That's part of the issue here. And I think as the, the, the issue became uh, bigger, it gained more traction, the more public uh, the, the address had to be. And again, I think there's wisdom in this too. You know, the more private the issue, one to one, probably the more private uh, the solution or the remedy that you have, the forum that you have to take care of it. The more public the issue and the traction that it is gaining as larger numbers of people aren't able to eat, probably the more public the forum ought to be to address the issue as people begin to talk about it. And it's wise counsel for us as well. I mean, if you think about it as a church, I'm not going to air a one-to-one -one conversation that I have with a person if they have an issue, and let's say they're not dealing with it. The time that I have with them is a private time, and we're going to trust the Lord that people deal with it. We may have to take another step, but you wouldn't want me to publicize an issue that you're having in private, would you? No. There's, there's wisdom and discernment in how you take an issue from privacy to publicity. Now, there's also issues that I think that arise in the life of the church that affect everyone in a sort of public way. A very benign one, if I could use that term, would be the issue that we had with parking when we first started. We watched people drive in. I, I literally could see them from the pulpit. Yeah, that was a red Dodge. It came in here. About 15 seconds later, it went out there. I, that's a problem. It's a problem for me as a pastor because I shouldn't be watching cars. You just pull the blinds, pastor. There's your, there's your problem. Solved, you know. They're wonderful little silver things. Just pull on it. Yeah. But I think we also were having a safety issue in the parking lot. We had a lot of people moving in tight spaces. We had to come up with a remedy. Now, it's not a perfect way to go about it. There is no perfect way to go about this. You know, we involved other people. We thought it through. We prayed. We talked to all the constituent groups and everything else and came up with a solution. Fallible, but useful for now. And we're working our way through it. We'll reevaluate it. But it was a public issue. It required a public address. Churches go through these kinds of things. And I think some of the, the harder stories that I hear from people that I know is that maybe some things that were meant to be more private became more public, or information that probably should have been more discreet became public knowledge, sometimes on the part of the leadership. And I'll tell you, there's a tension in that. There's judgment calls that are made. And it's, it's very difficult once you let you know, certain information out to you know, get your hands around it, your arms around it. There, there, there's, um, there's been a rise, I think, um, because of, you know, the, um, the pervasive sense of information out shared on the internet now of blogs that, are, that, that go over and rehearse, you know, the nature of what happens in churches um, with information. And I've stumbled across these blogs. They're, they're kind of broadly called discernment blogs. And some of them go through some of the hardships and challenges of, especially of larger churches. It's not a, I don't think it's a place you should reside in, but, you know, there's a challenge in some of these things where you might think there's a cookie cutter approach to handling every problem in a church. that You should just air it all. Or there's a problem with transparency and more people should have known. Maybe in some cases, yes. Maybe in some cases, no. But every, every leadership group is making judgment calls about the way they handle an issue. So the judgment call here was to become more public. I don't know if it's a mandate, but at least you see it had, there was a more public problem that required a more public solution. Third thing I think you see in, in the, the wisdom here that, that takes place in the group on the part of the apostles, they understood where they best 
we're able to serve. And that's why they say it's not right that we should give up preaching the word of God to serve tables. Now, when you read that, you might think, oh, oh, are they saying that serving tables is beneath them? I don't think they're saying that at all. I think what they're saying is, is like, when push comes to shove, we can't do all of this well. So we've been given a mandate on the part of Jesus to begin this thing, and it's come, it's come to a point now where we are limited, and it's now coming to the surface. I'm always reminded of that Clint Eastwood quote, you know, a man's got to know his limitations. It's true. They've got to know their limitations as a group. But I don't think they're saying, you know, um, we're not going to be involved in these menial tasks like serving tables. I don't think, not at all. They were already doing that. The question is, are they going to come to the point, the, the humble point of recognizing they're not doing it very well? And are they going to set a priority for themselves to continue on the primary task that they were given? Again, a hard thing to learn in any case in your life. At what point do you ask for help? And so the 12 are finally to that realization as it relates to the constituting of the church. Mark Dever, a well-known pastor um, uh, and writer, he makes the point that we just made in his book, The Compelling Community, when he writes, ultimately, it's everyone's job to protect the unity of the church. I restated it as if it were my own, but that's a quote from him. And I think it's, it's, it's well served. And he, and he quotes Ephesians 4, 3, be eager to maintain the unity of the spirit and the bond of peace. If you think about that as your primary, okay, that's my primary responsibility, to be eager to maintain the unity of the spirit and the bond of peace. What am I eager for? Am I eager for division? Am I eager for drama? Am I eager to maintain the unity of the spirit and the bond of peace? You know, what am I eager for? So here, I, I think a couple of questions diagnostically maybe to ask ourselves when addressing problems in the church. For you, and I'm speaking to myself as well. Just think about the first question. Is this issue that I'm having in the church a structural problem affecting more people than me? And is it hindering people's ability to receive care and the word of God? Just a question. Is the issue that I'm having a structural problem affecting more people than me and is it hindering people's ability to receive care in the word of God? Or is it my problem, my preference, or just something that's different from what I'm used to? These, these are hard questions to ask of yourself. Probably a, a good question to think of before um, you make any kind of um, move as it relates to communicating. Second question really is about the forum of communication. And here's the question. What is the, the very best forum for communicating both the problem and solution in whatever situation or issue that you are facing. What's the very best way to do it? Is a text the best way? Is an email the best way? Is a social media post the best way? Is a one-on-one -on -one conversation the best way? With church leadership? With a friend? With a small group? With your spouse? These, these are the kinds, I think, of diagnostic questions we should ask ourselves because at times when information goes into uh, the, the stratosphere or the, the cyber sphere, they create more questions than they do answers. And, and really, I think it's a question of wisdom as the best way to communicate uh, an issue that, that you may be having. You wouldn't want me to communicate an issue that I might be having with you on an Instagram post. After I just met with you and I put up, you know, let us love one another. And everybody knows, or at least you know and they know what you were talking about, but nobody else knows. So they say, why did you post that? And no reason. Hard day. You know, okay, hard day with who? And nobody. So and so. You know, I mean, this is, these are the questions that you create. And the question is, is that the very best forum to be able to work through whatever issue that you may be having. We are all susceptible to this. In fact, I just, I just walked a person through an issue they were having with, within their family about how to respond to an incendiary text. How do you do that? It's a group text. Should I reply? Should I not reply? Well, based on the gravity and the sensitivity of the situation with your family, do you think texting is the very best forum to express yourself. Ah, oh, but I gotta say something. Do you? 
Or should you wait 24 hours, sleep on it, pray about it, and then think about in the morning whether you should respond? You might feel much differently after a night's sleep. I'm not sleeping. Okay. After a night's lack of sleep. But think of the regret you have when you fire off something emotionally. And then the thing really snowballs. Then it's out of control. Then you got a fire on your hands. And it's all over text. There's no nuance. There's no body language. There's no eye contact. You don't have any of the benefit of anybody's presence. You don't have any fuller explanation. What's the conclusion we came to? Well, maybe just don't say anything. It's so hard not to. It's like torture. Yeah, but maybe you live to fight another day. Maybe whatever it was that was there kind of died off. It was just a pop-off kind of thing. Hard to say. All judgment calls. But the question is, what is the very best forum to communicate an issue that I might be having? So here, the, the forum was public. It affected people more publicly. It was a problem that you could get your hands around. And they didn't let it go unaddressed. You see the solution here, then, in verses 3 through 7. Spirit-guided solution was empowering and administrative. Holy Spirit was at work filling the fellowship to take care of the mission of Jesus, who were called to be his witnesses of the resurrection. If you go back to chapter 4, verse 31, you, you see something of the nature of what's happening characteristically in the church as they got together. And this is an important point. I don't, I don't want to miss it. Verse four, chapter 4, verse 31 says, And when they prayed, the place in which they were gathered together was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and continued to speak the word of God with boldness. Okay. Now, on the one hand, here's what I'm thinking. I immediately go to this idea. They spoke the word of God with boldness. They were preaching and, and they, were, they were talking to people who were against the church. And th- there was, there was some, some ma- you know, major you know, filling of the spirit for people to say bold things right at the right moment. Absolutely. But where else was the filling of the spirit happening? Behind the scenes. As they spoke to each other. And I think here, as they were coming up against a common issue that was affecting the Hellenists, they needed the wisdom of the Holy Spirit to know what to do next. And the filling of the Holy Spirit to guide the apostles and the rest of the people to the right decision was as crucial as the filling of the Holy Spirit to speak to people who needed to hear about Jesus. In other words, the Spirit was working in both the background and the foreground important point to remember because I usually only think about this in terms of the filling of the Spirit for people to speak to lost people, but it's actually the filling of the Spirit to speak to people who are saved. (laughs) And you know, you might need it as much or more when you think about those situations. When I was was an intern a long time ago at uh, the chapel in Akron, uh, you know, the interns all got around, got really theoretical about the leadership of the church and how to do a church service because we weren't doing one but we could watch and point out all the flaws, you know. And so we were having this, you know, deep discussion about the way the church service was being run. And um, someone said, yeah, you know, it's all very scripted. And, and, and as the last notes of the, you know, the piano were going down, the person who was the next in the service was to, was to saunter up, you know, right in, you know, speak the word and right down you go. And as they're, as they're taking that, you know, step off and then the music comes back up and it's all wonderful and there was a little bit of a criticism in that you know where is the moving of the spirit in this where is the spontaneity yeah where is it well subsequent to that conversation I don't know where it ever went but uh, the the pastor of the church had a a very uh, important comment that was always stuck with me and he asked the question you know was not the moving of the spirit happening in the preparation for the service and organizing it when the worship leaders and the pastors were meeting about it Oh, well, yeah, okay, never thought of that. Was the moving of the Spirit happening in the, in the planning meetings as much as in the public presentation? Well, I never had conceived of it that way, but absolutely. The Spirit of God had to be moving in those meetings for people to put together the service in a certain way, in the same way the Spirit of God is moving in a church service in our way, you know. It's not just the spontaneity and sort of the public presentation that we evaluate the moving of the Spirit. It's what happens both in the background and the foreground. 
And I think in the background here, especially in the decision-making on the part of the disciples, there is a moving of the Spirit. They're speaking the gospel to each other. God's at work. Well, there's also, I think, a moving of the Spirit in relationship to the kinds of ways in which the leaders are going to be picked. Listen to verse 3. Therefore, brothers and sisters, uh, pick out from among you seven men of good repute, full of the Holy Spirit and of wisdom, whom we will appoint to this duty. Okay? Again, the moving of the Spirit is seen, I think, in the criterion in which you pick the servants. They didn't say, okay, here's, here's the, who, who, who are the best people that cook? Who, where are they? Where are, the, where, are, where are my very finest servers? I mean the people who can really carry a tray. Where are those people? Oh, I saw a lady, her hand goes like this. Okay, put her in there. It wasn't like that. You know, who's, who's on the Myers-Briggs as a, you know, a, a, uh, you know who, who's an E? You know, who's an extrovert? Oh, there's plenty of extroverts. Yeah, we'll, we'll get them, Pastor. It wasn't like that at all. The criterion was very spirit-led. First one. Wh- who's good reputation? Who's spoken well of? Okay. Yeah, that's really important. Because when they show up at someone's doorstep, and the, you know, Helen opens the door. You go, oh, you? Ugh, I didn't expect you to be here. No, but it's someone of great reputation. Because people of good reputation associate with other people of good reputation, and that's how your leadership structure ought to grow. Full of the Spirit and of wisdom. Okay, that's important too. Full of the Spirit. Well, they were believers who were endowed by the Holy Spirit to live lives that were sanctified, that they were committed to personal holiness. So these people who were serving weren't just people who said, you know, I'm pretty good at all this. I don't know about all that spiritual stuff they're talking about up front, but I'm, I'm going to nail this part of my service. <clears throat> the most important thing about being a server was your heart, was your life submitted to Christ. All the stuff you could learn about the serving, okay, all the technical stuff, you can be trained on. But it's your heart and your life that is the most important part. And if that's not right, then we have maybe a person who's able to do something, but they're a spiritual cadaver underneath. That's a problem. So you see this moving of the spirit in the criterion that's set for those who would serve others. The fullness of the spirit is, I think, distinct from the filling of the spirit in a helpful way. I was reading again, <clears throat> Billy Graham's book on the Holy Spirit, he had a good illustration about this. He talked about the fullness of the Spirit being that state of being for any believer who, uh, any person who's come to Christ, a believer has the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. If you think about it this way, that's a little bit different from the occasional filling of the Holy Spirit. Your house has a main water line. Supplies you with water to drink, take shower, everything else that you do with water. You think about that as, as the being full of the Holy Spirit. That is, the Holy Spirit dwelling in you. You have that, that rich supply of, of water coming into you. You have a source that uh, cannot be cut off. Outside your house, you have a fire hydrant somewhere on your street. You have another source of water that can rush in at a time where you, where you most need it. You have two different ways of receiving this kind of uh, movement, if you like, of water. In the same way, the filling of the Holy Spirit is like that hydrant. There are specific occasions where you're going to need the power of the Holy Spirit to really move in your life. Like a sudden rush, if you like. Pray to God, please, Lord, help me. I need to know what to say right now. Please, Lord, help me. Fill me with your spirit to give me wisdom on how to know what to do next. And the sudden rush may not feel necessarily like the sudden rush of anything. But God promises to move in people who ask. And we're commanded to be filled with the Holy Spirit. And on occasion, God does that. and shows us things that we wouldn't have otherwise seen. So here now, people full of the Holy Spirit begins with men. Okay, It's not relegated only to men. It just began there. <clears throat> if you go to 1 Timothy 3, you see in uh, the diaconate, those who are servers, those are both men and women. But it starts with men here and it continues to grow. So, if you just notice here, some of the wisdom that comes along with this. The men who are chosen here to start everything, all their names are mainly Hellenistic names. They're mainly Greek-speaking names. Now, why is that wise? People who are being most neglected were the Greek-speaking widows. 
So why not match up the Greek-speaking people with the Greek-speaking? You know, that makes sense. They understand the language. You know? It doesn't mean anything in relation to ethnic background. It's just smart. You know, there's not going to be a, a language cap in the reception of care. That's one thing. You notice the apostles, they continue to maintain <laughs> about staying in their lane. They say, we will devote ourselves to prayer and the ministry of the word. Okay? That's my favorite commercial about the tattoo artist and the guy's looking down like, are you sure about that? And he goes, stay in your lane, bro. And uh, I like that commercial. I always think about that commercial, you know, I'm sort of stepping out of my lane. You know, stay in your lane, bro. And that's, I, that's what they're saying here. They're saying, look, this is our lane. We've been commissioned with the word of God and prayer. That's what the leadership is supposed to do. It's what the leadership is supposed to do here. You know, we get together for meetings, and, and I, I'm only saying this to, uh, just to give you a window of insight, but we, we have elders meetings. We, we go through the Bible. We read the Bible together. We talk about it. We go through prayer lists together through the membership list. We go through non-membership concerns that come up. Prayer in the Word is really how the meeting is not only kicked off, but a large portion of it is devoted to that. I... I never had been to an elders meeting until I came to Parkside. I couldn't believe at Parkside how much time we spent reading the Bible and just praying. I mean, I'm telling you, there were times where we were praying so long, I was like, I got to stand up. Like, I got to stretch my legs a little bit. I felt bad. Like, I might even have to go to the bathroom. You know, this has gone on a long time. And, you know, you laugh, but it's like, that was refreshing. That the, the, the meeting was, all right, let's get to the business. You know, item A, let's go. It was more like, open the Bible to the book of Romans. Read chapter 1. What do we think it says? Somebody walk us through it. Man, we're doing this before the business, which means this is actually the business. The other stuff is going to come. But if we don't have the scripture and the prayer, the other stuff is going to go way off track pretty quickly. That's actually going to be the thing that eats our lunch. But we need to be submitted to this first. So we kept the same pattern here. Now, does that mean you're doing it all right? No. It means we need to do better. We need to get better. But like the apostles, we've got to stay in our lane, bro. We've got to be submitted to this stuff. This is the most important part. The other stuff is going to come that we need to make progress in. Third thing, I think, and you see it in Stephen's life here, as, as he's described, some of the wisdom that you see. Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit. Now he gets, you know, he gets the most prominent uh, description of his life. And then you see later on in the, in the chapter, Stephen, full of grace and power, is doing great wonders and signs among the people. So there's something special about Stephen. God's endowed Stephen. He's speaking to people. People are coming to faith. He's visibly influenced by the Holy Spirit. The thing about Stephen is, is that he gets into his ministry, and it's going to end very abruptly for him. He's going, he's going to be killed for what he's saying. And there is a kind of sorrow that comes along with serving in the ministry. There, there are ways in which God is going to bring an abrupt end to some people and some ministry that we wouldn't otherwise choose. Now, if I'm writing this story and I'm looking at someone like Stephen, I'm saying to myself, yeah, Stephen, this, this, guy's, your, this guy's your star in terms of servants. He's not one of the 12, but man, he's great. And what happens? He's the first guy taken out. Now, Lord, what are you doing with that? Why would, why would it, when it seems to be going so well, why would one of the best servants, one of the original seven here, why would you take him out now? I don't, I don't have an answer for that, but what I see here is that service is going to come with sorrow. There are going to be things that end abruptly that wouldn't be part of our plan, that God has a plan in some of this that we're not going to be able to explain right in the moment. It's just not going to make sense. So what do we do? We've got to trust God. You know, who was standing there as Stephen was being stoned to death? Saul of Tarsus. 
who was going to be converted a short time later to pick up the mantle and then some to be preaching the Bible and to see the church grow? It's going to be Saul of Tarsus who would become Paul. Now, what, in, in God's unbelievable plan, who would have ever dreamt up that one servant would be replaced by another servant like this? Only the Lord can do this. Only the Lord. Which brings us, I think, full circle all the way back to when, when we're engaged in any bit of service for the Lord, we, we just have to trust him. There's going to be decisions that are made by the Lord that affect us that are not decisions that we would make ourselves. There's going to be trajectories in which we think a ministry should go that it's, it's just not going to go. And we have to trust the Lord in it. And part of this service is going to come with sorrow. It's a part of the deal. Because not only are we sinful people, but we also serve a public that doesn't want to see the word of God preached. And in this case, it was taken care of in a dramatic fashion. But this is the paradox, I think, of the growth of the church. As the more it gets squeezed, the more it grows. So we look in Stephen's life, we see, and I think Stephen will tell this this in heaven, it's not about me. It's about the growth of the word of God. And the more the growth of the word of God, the more that is increasing, the more people will come around to the church. I, I, just, I still like the way the ruling authority said to Peter and John, your teaching is filling Jerusalem. The word of God is filling up the city. It's no wonder that the church was growing because the word was growing. It wasn't about the messengers. It wasn't about Stephen. It wasn't about Peter. It wasn't about John. It was about the word of God increasing. And the importance of seeing that increase everywhere. Last point. The benevolent care that is given to the Hellenists always comes with the word of God. And you can't separate those two things. It's, it's so tempting. And it's tempting for me as a pastor you know, to say, you know, well, let's be the hands and feet of Christ. Let's go out. Let's build bridges. Let's do works of service. Let's make sure everybody sees the care that comes along with people who are Christians. And not give people the, the spiritual care that they need in knowing who Jesus is. So tempting, because that's the hard part. The hard part is bringing in the spiritual care that is necessary for people to hear. Being able to say to them, you know, caring for your body is one thing. Taking care of a sickness or some other kind of infirmity is one thing, but really all that is is an illustration of the fact that we are all spiritually sick. We are all dying not only physically, but spiritually. We are all in need of a remedy that we cannot provide ourselves. We need Christ. And again, how challenging it is, but yet how rewarding it is. When you take a trip or you, you, you talk to a person about these things and it starts to make sense. Maybe not even to them, but to you. You know, as a church, we could do kinds of things where we clean people up, we give people enough food, we give people enough sustenance, whatever it might be. They might be the most well-fed, healthy, physically types of people and still on their way to hell if we don't tell them about Christ. What is their most important issue? What's the most important investment we could make? There's one, there's one first investment. It's a bridge to investing in the other way thinking about spiritual life. And if we let those two things become divorced from each other, then we are just kind of like the Rotary Club. We're really not distinct from any other group of people around here, but we have a message. And that benevolent care was married to the Word of God. And we have to be careful, because here we are now in this room. We say, all right, we got here. First baptism, woohoo! Yeah, all that other stuff you've been talking about for years. Yeah, we're here. Let's fill this place up. Yeah. So you've got the preaching part, but you've got no bridge to the community outside you. No, close the doors. We don't want to get this place messed up. No, we do. We do. In a right sense. We want to build those bridges. We want to see people who have real ability and skill use them. We want to be able to lead in that. We, we want to see people who are good at stuff. Use that for God's glory and other people's good. That's why we're here. 
But we've got to make sure that we strike a balance between those two things. And, and that's, a, that's a tension that we all live within. You have a problem. You have a spirit-guided solution. A perceived sense of neglect. And then a perceived, uh, and more than a perceived, but a concrete uh, step toward preserving the unity of the church on the part of both the leadership and the laity as it relates to the early church. But neglect is the kind of thing that can creep into any church at any time, especially on the part of people who are just coming around. And I know this personally. When, when um, Mandy and I, when I was in seminary, we went to a large church. That's kind of where we'll finish here, but we were going to a large church. We went for a while, and you know, nobody was talking to us. Nobody was coming up to meet us and ask us how awesome we are. You know, like, I'll tell you how awesome we are if, you, if you'll just ask, you know. But you have to ask. I'm waiting. You know, oh, these people are so cold. And so after a while, um, we decided we were going to try another church. You know, probably those people will recognize it when we come in. And um, so we walked into a service, and it was literally like the two of us were on this side of the room, you know, and everybody else was on the other side of the room. And everybody knew we were there. And the only thing I could think of the entire time at the service was, can we make it for the 1115 back at the other church? It was it. It was just an uncomfortable feeling, but it became apparent to us that if we were going to get to know anybody at the church that we had just come from, we had to take a step forward. We had to take a step toward the people. There, there may have been some structural problems, yes, but part of the remedy of that wasn't pointing that out to the leadership right away, but it was about us just taking a step toward people in faith and doing it again and again and again. The, the, the remedy, you know, the, the, early, the early days of church websites, I went on the website and I looked, for, I looked at all the pastor's faces. I saw the one that I considered the nicest. His name was Greg Norwine. I still remember it. So I wrote Greg Norwine an email. Uh, we've been coming to the church for a while. Could we have a cup of coffee? Yes. We got together, had a cup of coffee, and a few years later, we were in leadership at this church. It's just amazing how God does stuff like that. But preserving the unity of the church, I think, is really taking steps forward. It's taking steps forward to ask yourself, where are you at? And I think it takes steps in taking steps forward in reaching out to people. You know, that might be the leadership of the church. Maybe it's not. Maybe it's the leadership, or maybe it's people in a, in a smaller context. Maybe it's the person sitting next to you. Maybe for the people who feel like they're in a church like this and they're in, maybe it's up to you to look around to see, has anybody been coming in here that just hasn't said a word to anybody? Maybe I should go say hello to them. It's all our responsibility here. If we want to be on ramps to help people in, feel that sense of unity, we have to all reach out. It's not just my job. It's not just the job of the elders. It's all of our jobs. You think about the protection of the unity. Once we're in a place for a while, we see some things that we might consider uh, issues. The question is, how do we communicate those two things, uh, those, those kinds of things? There are ways to do it, but, but it's a matter of how and the wisdom of the Spirit to, to lead and guide us. Church is full of sinners. <laughs> I learned that when I was young. I saw people disagree with each other. A couple summers ago, I went back to preach there. It was surreal. I saw some of the same people. But you know, God had led them. God used them. At the time, I wasn't a Christian. I became a Christian. Then I was standing in their pulpit. That even through some of those disagreements, God was still working. And he still continues to work, even through some of those disagreements. And so the, I think the challenge before us is, as we look at this, you know, what, do I consider this my job to preserve the unity of the church? The answer is yes. But we're going to do it from different elevations. But it's good that the church early on showed us some of these very human things and, and um, showed us a little bit of the way forward. Let's pray. Father, as we think of uh, the issues that arise in our lives, uh, and especially the issues in our church, uh, Lord, we ask that, um, that you'll give us wisdom. We pray, Lord, that uh, as we think about um, just shortcomings that we have, just give us wisdom. How, how do we deal with this? And Lord, we thank you for the real, the, the real sense of what's going on in the early church and how they were real people. We pray, Lord, that you will help us to be real just like them. And we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.